tonight. Space Ferris welcomed. China successfully launches Shenzhou 19 and the new crew docks at space station. Kremlin's triad. Russia's Putin launches ground, sea and air drills of nuclear forces simulating retaliatory strikes. Successor elected. Lebanese armed group Hezbollah names Naim Qasim as its new leader, while Israel warns his tenor would be temporary. And relics of civilization. A lost Mayan city has been found with modern technology unearthing monumental structures. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here to bring you the key stories across the globe and we begin today's bulletin in China. Chinese spacecraft Shenzhou-19 with a three-person crew including the country's first female space engineer has docked after a journey of more than six hours. Flames shot out of the rocket launcher as it took to the skies, lighting up the Gobi Desert with a deafening roar. Hundreds of people lined the streets waving and cheering names of the Taikonauts, China's word for astronauts, as they were sent off. At Tiangong Space Station, the Shenzhou-19 crew met with three other astronauts who are meaning to Shenzhou-18 and will return to Earth on the 4th of November. The crew will use the homegrown space station as a base for six months to conduct experiments and carry out spacewalks as Beijing gathers experience and intelligence for its eventual mission to put someone on the moon by 2030. Beijing declared the launch of Shenzhou-19 a complete success. It is one of 100 launches China has planned in a record year of space exploration as it tries to outdo its rival, the United States. Just two years ago, President Xi Jinping declared that to explore the vast cosmos, develop the space industry and build China into a space power is their eternal dream. But Washington has a contradictory perspective seeing the country's ambition and fast space progress as a real threat. Earlier this year, NASA Chief Bill Nelson said the United States and China were in effect in a race to return to the moon where he fears Beijing wants to stake territorial claims. He told legislators that he believed their civilian space program was also a military program. However, in Dongfeng Space City, a town built to support the launch site, China's space program is celebrated. All three convey their deep sense of national pride and state media has emphasized that this will be its youngest crew to date. The message is clear. This is a new generation of space travelers and an investment in the country's future. China has already selected its next group of astronauts and they will train for potential lunar missions as well as to crew the space station. Anthony Albanese fronted the media after newspapers reported he had a direct line to former CEO Joyce, which he used to request flight upgrades through the Qantas Charmin's launch program. When he was transport minister and later opposition leader, Anthony Albanese received flight upgrades for personal travel to Rome, LA and London. A book by a former Nine newspaper reporter says he liaised directly with CEO Alan Joyce about it. But when pressed, the Prime Minister could only recall discussions about other flights. And he went on many other tangents. He attacked the author of the book. He pointed to other MPs declaring flight upgrades. He compared his declarations to those of the opposition leader and compared their travel arrangements. Except last year he did accept a private helicopter flight from trucking magnate Lindsay Fox. For all the retorts, exactly how Anthony Albanese secured those upgrades still isn't entirely clear. And the opposition leader is questioning whether any of this influenced the government's decision last year to block Qatar from offering more international flights. A spokesperson for the Prime Minister calls that suggestion a pathetic attempt at creating a headline. Over in Japan, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party suffered its worst electoral defeat in over a decade, and the country now faces an uncertain political future. However, the Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba has vowed to continue ruling the country, despite the loss his party suffered at the general election. Now, to get a detailed report on the story, we have Adhaderana World News special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa joining us from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Rasita, tell us what the future holds for the Japanese with the current political turmoil that the country is in. As we continue the coverage of the post-election, things are getting a little by little clearer now. As the Prime Minister Ishiba, uh, like even today, 
uh, he said he would not resign and he would uh, obviously going to stand uh, for the uh, for the prime minister election in the next parliament session and also the cdp the main opposition leader nodasa also is very clear in his uh, aim to becoming the uh, next prime minister so what these people are discussing mostly in japan now it is the maths obviously the number game so what is the number the magic number is 233 of course out of the 465 seats the majority any party to win the parliament majority need to have 233 as it stands now the uh, the ldp and the coalition would ha only have about 215 and the opposition have more votes about 250 so people might wonder why the opposition is not have not pushing uh, to gain power in Japan. Like it's, even though we call it opposition, uh, it constitutes of a variety of uh, political parties from extreme right to communist. So uh, including everyone in a coalition is a pretty much impossible task for the main opposition CDP. And their discussions are mainly focused on two parties. Uh, one party, what they call in Japan, Japanese, is Kokomi uh, Misto, I think it's trans abbreviated as DPP in English. And they actually had uh, have 27, around 27 to 28 seats in the next parliament. As well as there's a one party in mainly in the Kansai area, they're mainly strong in the Kansai area, they also have 30 odd seats. So the Nodasan's main target would be these two parties. Even though, uh, for example, like uh, this DPP party, it used to be uh, part of the uh, Democratic Party of Japan with the Nodasan, but they had a split and they are in the different spectrum, the different political spectrum. So it won't be easy for the CDP to convince him then into a coalition. So let's look at the chances of Ishibasa. Even though he has 215, uh, people give him uh, the odds actually with him. Uh, one factor works for him is the uh, the ex LDP members who are part of the political fund scandal, the unreported funds. Uh, few people won the election as independent because they did not get the nomination from the LDP. So Ishibasan can count them. Uh, he can count on them uh, to support him uh, in, the parli in, the, in the parliament. So that numbers varies, I think, roughly from five to ten people. So he could gain the support, independence. And also Ishiba-san, Ishiba-san's uh, general secretary, Moriyama-san, is a very important position in, in Japanese political parties. He's actually planning to have a discussion uh, with the Kokomin Mishto tomorrow. And they have the numbers, they have the 27. So if, if Ishiba-san and the, uh, the general secretary can convince them into a coalition, even a partial coalition, Ishiba-san would be ended up as a winner and the next prime minister. So as we continue to uh, monitor this maths problem, uh, for the politicians, it's business as usual, and the winners are having their meetings and, and giving the, uh, the television interviews, and the losers like Marukawa Tamao, the former minister who represented my constituency, is, uh, is in the shadow of a former glory now. Over to you. Thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa joining us from Tokyo, Japan. <music> Meanwhile, Russia successfully conducted a strategic nuclear exercise with all missiles hitting their targets. Defense Minister Andrei Belusov claimed the exercise is intended to practice strategic offensive in response to a nuclear strike by the enemy. Russia has begun major nuclear weapons exercises, which its defense ministry describes as preparation for a potential nuclear strike by the enemy. The drills included the test fires of intercontinental ballistic missiles from the Kamchatka Peninsula and two nuclear submarines, as well as practice launches of long-range cruise missiles from nuclear-capable strategic bombers. The Defence Ministry said that all the missiles reached their designated targets. It comes after weeks of Russian signals that Moscow will respond if the West allows Ukraine to use Western-supplied longer-range weapons to strike deep inside Russia. On his visit to Beijing, the president of Finland called on China to assist in de-escalating Russian nuclear activity. It follows U.S. reports that North Korea has sent 10,000 troops to Russia, where they are believed to be headed for the Kursk border region.
With continued international focus on military ties between Pyongyang and Moscow, North Korea's top diplomat is making yet another visit to Moscow to further tighten relations. Tensions are rising as new intelligence from Ukraine suggests that North Korean soldiers are being deployed to Russia's Kursk region to assist Moscow's military efforts there. According to the Kyiv Independent, Ukraine's military intelligence agency reported on Sunday that Russia is transporting North Korean soldiers using trucks with civilian license plates based on intercepted radio communications from Russian military officials. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in a video address posted on X warned that North Korean troops may join the battlefield in a matter of days, adding that Ukraine could soon be forced to fight North Korean troops in Europe. According to the Wall Street Journal, the 3,000 North Korean soldiers being sent to the front lines are described as young, likely in their late teens or early 20s. The report also noted that the soldiers appear relatively short and slightly built, reflecting widespread malnourishment across the regime. When asked about the humanitarian concerns surrounding this deployment, Seoul's Ministry of Unification said on Monday that it is closely monitoring the situation. On the same day, a high-level government delegation, including defense and intelligence officials from South Korea, is set to brief NATO and EU member states in Brussels. The delegation aims to provide NATO and the EU with critical updates on North Korean troop movements in Russia. Well, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now. With just one week remaining until the U.S. election, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke to supporters from the Ellipse in Washington, D.C., the location where her opponent and former President Donald Trump addressed supporters before the attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Meanwhile, Trump was in Allentown, Pennsylvania, just two days after a comedian made racist remarks about Puerto Rico from the podium during his rally in New York, triggering a firestorm of criticism. All eyes are again locked on Pennsylvania this election cycle, with former President Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris making their final pitches to Keystone State waters ahead of Election Day. Amid their high-profile closing arguments for the election cycle, both candidates have continued their laser focus on Pennsylvania, which is viewed as the state that will likely determine the overall outcome of the election. Harris is expected to travel to Harrisburg, the state's capital, after visiting Philadelphia. Harris's rally is billed as a get-out-the-vote initiative in waning days of the election. The Daily Show host, John Stewart, hit back at critics of comedian Tony Hinchcliffe's performance at former President Donald Trump's Madison Square Garden rally. Stewart laughed as he made sarcastic remarks towards him in response of a montage of news anchors expressing indignation over Hinchcliffe's jokes. Hinchcliffe was widely criticized by media networks and politicians for his roast-style jokes, most notably when he called Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage in reference to the U.S. territory's overflowing landfills, as well as other digs at Hispanics and black people that critics labeled racism. The comments were later disavowed by the former president's campaign. Trump campaign senior advisor Daniel Alvarez noted in a statement that this joke does not reflect the views of President Trump or the campaign. Disturbing scenes in Gaza make headlines again as Israeli airstrikes leveled a five-story building in northern Gaza that resulted in at least 110 deaths. Among the dead and missing are at least 25 children, according to the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry. Desperate scenes in North Gaza tonight after an Israeli airstrike destroyed a five-story building housing displaced families. With just days to go and a deadline set by the Biden administration for Israel to improve the humanitarian conditions in northern Gaza or risk losing future military aid, this now one of the deadliest strikes of the war. The Hamas-run health ministry saying at least 93 Palestinians are killed, including at least 25 children. The situation in the north deteriorating for weeks. This girl standing with a dead body, shocked to be alive after another Israeli strike. And officials at one of Gaza's last functioning hospitals unable to treat the wounded after a deadly IDF raid. 
And tonight, global concern after the Israeli parliament voted to ban UNRWA, the UN aid agency for Palestinian refugees operating inside Gaza. The State Department and the Pentagon saying if implemented, this move could violate US law. Meanwhile, Lebanon's Hezbollah announced it has chosen deputy head Naim Qasem to succeed Hassan Nasrallah as leader after his death in, in an airstrike on southern Beirut last month. For more than three decades, Sheikh Naim Qasem was Hezbollah's deputy leader and a dedicated spokesperson for the group. We as Hezbollah will continue to acquire strength, increase in number and prepare as much equipment as we can in order to persist on the field facing Israel and those behind it. Now he has claimed the top spot. On Tuesday, Hezbollah's Shura Council chose Qasem to succeed Hassan Nasrallah as Secretary General after he was killed in an Israeli strike on September 27th. But it was not a straightforward succession path. In the month since, Hezbollah has suffered a series of blows. Just weeks after Nasrallah's death, Hashem Safiuddin, considered his most likely predecessor, was also killed in an Israeli airstrike. And the Israeli government has already warned that Qasem could be next. Qasem was born in 1953 to a family from South Lebanon and he was raised in Beirut. In 1982, he became one of Hezbollah's founding members and often spoke on behalf of the group when Nasrallah was in hiding. However, Qasem has his shortcomings. Significantly, he was not particularly involved in military matters, which were mostly managed by Safiuddin and Nasrallah. Since his predecessor's death, he has vowed the group will keep fighting Israel, but has also shown openness towards a ceasefire in Lebanon. Atlanta police and SWAT have taken a suspect into custody who reportedly barricaded himself at the Four Seasons Hotel in Midtown and began firing shots through the walls and door and off the balcony of his apartment during a standoff. WSB, uh, there's reporters on the ground there as well that say they heard several gunshots. Now at this hour, police are saying they have in fact arrested a suspect who barricaded himself. Now all of this happening on a high floor inside this Midtown Atlanta hotel. We also have this amateur video right here that shows somebody that appears to throw things uh, from a balcony at this hotel. At one point it looks like papers, maybe some clothing that's launched from that balcony as all of this was unfolding. Over in the EU region, NGOs are raising the alarm about mercury concentration in canned tuna after an investigation found the metal in all samples taken. New findings show canned tuna in Europe has a high mercury concentration exceeding the limit of other fish. When it comes to the World Health Organization's concern about public health, it's on the same list as asbestos and arsenic. Yet every one of the 148 tins of tuna analysed by the Bloom and Food Watch organisations were found to contain mercury. Selected at random in Britain, France, Italy, Germany and Spain, the levels they say are dangerous. The maximum level of mercury allowed in tuna is one milligram per kilo, and that's more than three times the limits allowed for other types of fish. A threshold that Bloom and Food Watch say was purposefully set to make sure that most tuna can be sold. The groups are accusing public health authorities and the tuna lobby of prioritising economic benefits over people's health. Mercury is often spread through the air and tuna accumulate the heavy metals from eating their prey. Its ingestion by humans can lead to various brain disorders. The groups are calling for tighter regulation and have launched a petition to 10 of Europe's largest retailers, demanding that they ban advertising and ads labels to tuna products to inform shoppers about the health risks associated with mercury. And now let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. A huge Mayan city has been discovered centuries after it disappeared under a jungle canopy in Mexico. Archaeologists found pyramids, sports fields, causeways connecting districts and amphitheatres in the southeastern state of Campeche. They're calling it Valeriana. 
deep in the jungle of Mexico, a lost Maya city now found thanks to new laser technology. PhD student Lucal Thomas says he was looking through data on the internet and the numbers revealed a hidden gem. Across the sites the team mapped, more than 6,000 ancient buildings tied to the Mayas revealed their way of life. Pyramids and plazas, even a court for ball games. The scientists named the city Valeriana after a nearby lagoon. And based on the architecture, they think it was founded before the year 150. The Maya had hundreds of cities across Central America in its heyday, around 250 to 900 CE. But then the civilization collapsed and cities turned to jungles. Today, tourists from around the world flock to the Yucatan Peninsula to see the remnants. Wonders like Chichen Itza, Tulum, Coba. And now LiDAR, the same remote sensing technique used in self-driving cars and other robotics, is helping to discover more hidden cities like Achiotal in Guatemala. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Sunny Vimudan Naika will join you next with the nice nightly business report. Thank you for watching and have a good night.